to welcome everybody to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. We're currently doing a series on the biblical festivals. Presently, we are studying the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost. In a previous session, we explained how Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai and we're going to build on that understanding in this week's teaching. We are going to show that not only did Yeshua give the Torah at Mount Sinai, but there was a marriage that was made at Mount Sinai between Messiah and the house of Jacob. That covenant was broken. The house of Jacob was unfaithful and became the adulterous wife of Yeshua, who is the bridegroom that entered into marriage with his people at Mount Sinai. As a result, in order to forgive the sins of the house of Jacob, that is going to be why he ends up dying on the tree for the purpose of redeeming his adulterous bride, his adulterous wife, and in doing so, he offers salvation to all the whosoever's in the world who will receive his redemptive work, his shed blood on the tree. By receiving the Messiah into our hearts and our lives, we can have the forgiveness of our sins. The message today is going to be entitled, The Marriage of Messiah to the House of Jacob. In order to understand why there was a marriage made between the Messiah and the house of Jacob, we need to understand the purpose of creation, the reason why the God of Israel created the heavens and the earth. The ultimate reason was for the purpose of the Messiah and for Messiah to have a destiny mate who is the nation of Israel, who is his bride. In the book, Sound the Great Shofar by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, on page 111 he writes, Our sages write, and this is from Sanhedrin 96b, that the world was created solely and exclusively for the Messiah. Not only was the world created for the Messiah, but he writes on page 13 that the rabbis teach that the Messiah and the redemption, that would be the Messianic era, the end of the exile of the house of Jacob, as the ultimate purpose for the creation of the world. For God created the world in order that he should have a dwelling place among mortals. And this goal will be realized in the era of redemption or the Messianic era. So the purpose of creation is that Messiah would rule and reign with his people during the Messianic era. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16, given the fact that it is the traditional Jewish understanding that the world was created solely for the Messiah, it tells us in Colossians 1 verses 15 and 16 about Yeshua. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. All things were created for the Messiah. This is the exact thing that Rabbi Schneerson makes mention in his book that the creation of the heavens and the earth was exclusively for the purpose of Messiah and his role in the world. So let's look at the understanding of the purpose of creation by looking at the first word in the Bible, which is Breshit. And if you would look at the word Breshit in a Torah scroll, what you would notice is that the very first letter of the Bible and thus the first letter of the first word, Breshit, which in English is in the beginning, there is an enlarged bet. The explanation of why there's an enlarged bet is that the word bet or the letter bet in Hebrew means a house. So 
given the fact that the heavens and earth were created so that God would have a dwelling place among mortals and that the world was created exclusively for the Messiah, we get an understanding that the reason why there's an enlarged bet is that the God of Israel wanted to have a house in the world that would be for the purpose of the Messiah. Now, if we take the first two letters of Breshit, you have the Bet and the Resh, which means Bar, and Bar means son. So the explanation is that the God of Israel wanted to have a house in the earth for his son. If we look at the first two letters of Breshit, we have the Bet and the Resh, and the last two letters of Breshit, we have the Yod and the Tav. And if we put these letters together, we have the word Brit, which means in Hebrew, covenant. So the God of Israel wanted to make a house for his son, and the way that he was going to do this was through covenant. Now, if we separate the Bet from the rest of the word Breshit, you have the word Reshit, and Reshit in Hebrew means the first, the beginning, the choicest, or the first fruit. In Genesis Midrash Rabbah 1.4, in looking at Reshit and separating the bet from the rest of the word, which is Reshit, in Hebrew, when you do this, this can be rendered for the beginning, or as you would say it in English, which would make sense, for the sake of the beginning. So our understanding is the God of Israel wanted to make a house for his son by a covenant for the sake of the beginning. In the scripture, as we're going to see here in a moment, Israel is called the beginning. So the world was created not only for the Messiah, but for Israel as well, and ultimately the Torah, because the Torah is called the beginning. So Israel thus is going to become the destiny mate of the Messiah, and this is going to be the purpose of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Israel, Torah, and the Messiah, who are all one, is the purpose of creation. In the book, In the Garden of Torah, which is Rebbe Schneerson's commentary on the various Torah portions throughout the year, in commenting about the word Breshit, he writes, to ensure that the lower world would be capable of being transformed into a dwelling place for the God of Israel, God embedded two distinct elements within creation from the outset. Our sages comment that creation is for the sake of the Torah or that the Torah would be given and would be obeyed in the world. For the sake of the Torah, which is referred to as the beginning of his path, and for the sake of the people who the God of Israel would be in covenant relationship with, which is the nation of Israel, who is also referred to as the beginning. So where do we see Israel referred to as the Reshit or the beginning? Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 3. Israel was holiness under the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. The word first fruits is the Strong's number 7225 and it is the Hebrew word Reshit. So Israel is called the first fruits of his increase. If you look up the word increase in Hebrew, it can also be rendered crop, the first fruit of his crop. Israel is called the beginning, but the Torah is also called the beginning. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, it says, The Lord possessed me, and this is wisdom speaking, in the beginning, that is Reshit, the Strong's number 7225, in the beginning of his way, before his works of old, and this is referring to the creation of the heavens and the earth. It then says in Proverbs 8, 23, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. Now, based upon this understanding of Breshit being the first word in the Bible, this is what John is making a reference to when he begins writing his gospel in John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, in the beginning, he's making a reference to Breshit. In the beginning was the word, and what he's doing, he's making a connection, he's saying that Yeshua is the Reshit. 
In the beginning is the Word. In other words, Reshit is the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And Yeshua is called the first fruits in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, afterward they that are Messiahs at his coming. So once again, in Genesis Midrash Rabbah 1.4, the understanding of Breshit, separating the bet from the word Breshit, this can be rendered for the sake of the beginning. So to summarize what is being communicated by examining in detail the first word of the Bible, Breshit, we understand that the God of Israel wanted to build a house for his son. He was going to do this by making a covenant with the beginning or for the sake of the beginning. And all of this comes together at Mount Sinai. Who is called the beginning? Israel, Torah, and the Messiah. Since Israel, Torah, and the Messiah are all called the beginning, they are one with each other, and ultimately they are in covenant relationship with each other, and this is going to be realized at Mount Sinai. In the book, In the Garden of Torah, by Rebbe Schneerson, on page 108, he writes that the giving of the Torah completes the purpose of creation, or it's, it's a major element and aspect of creation, is that the Torah be given to the nation of Israel by the Messiah, the reason why the God of Israel created the heavens and the earth. So you cannot separate the Messiah from Torah, the Messiah from Israel, Israel from the Messiah, the Torah from the Messiah, because they are all one. That being the case, if the enemy wanted to thwart the plan and the understanding of the God of Israel in the world, what is it that he, he needs to attack? He needs to attack this oneness, so he needs to separate the Messiah from Torah, and this is what traditional Christianity has done. And also he needs to separate Israel and Torah from the Messiah, and this is what he's done through traditional Judaism. Therefore, there is not a recognition by the people of the God of Israel who he's in covenant relationship that Israel, Torah, and the Messiah are one, recognizing who Israel is, what the Torah is, and who the Messiah is. And ultimately, redemption will happen when we see these elements that they're all one and we recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah and those who are in covenant relationship with him are a part of the nation of Israel whether natural born or grafted in but in Messiah we are all a redeemed people regardless of who or where we were born and we follow the Torah in expressing our faith in him. In the book, In the Garden of Torah by Rebbe Schneerson, on page 4, he says, Israel, the Torah, and the Holy One, we understand the Holy One is the Messiah, or Yahweh, Israel, Torah, and Yahweh are all one, and that the Torah is God's will, and it is God's wisdom. Where are we told in the scripture that the Torah is the will of the God of Israel? Psalm chapter 40, verse 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your Torah is within my heart. And so if we do the will of the God of Israel in the earth, we are going to be following Torah. And if we truly follow Torah, we also know who the Messiah is as well. You're not really following Torah if you don't know who the Messiah is. You're following man's Torah and not the Torah of the God of Israel. So in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Yeshua tells us how we're to pray. Pray this way. Our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. What's his kingdom? That's the Messianic era. And what's got to happen during the Messianic era? Messiah's got to be teaching the Torah to all nations from Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. The Torah is the will of the God of Israel. When his kingdom comes, his will is going to be done in the earth, which is the purpose of creation, as his will is being done in heaven. Now, we need to understand that if Messiah is making a covenant and giving the Torah to the nation of Israel or the house of Jacob, we need to understand a biblical name for the house of Jacob. They are likened unto an olive tree. 
in the earth today is a natural, literal house of Jacob, and these are the people who are physical descendants from those who are at Mount Sinai, but we also have in the earth today a redeemed spiritual people of the God of Israel called the redeemed house of Jacob. They are the redeemed family of the Messiah. So Messiah is in covenant relationship with a literal house of Jacob. Some of the literal house of Jacob are not yet redeemed, and he's also in covenant relationship with a redeemed house of Jacob, a literal house of Jacob and a redeemed house of Jacob. How do we understand this? Because in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, it says, The Lord called your name a green olive tree, fair and of a goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. He has kindled fire upon it, and the branches are broken. We have an olive tree whose branches are broken. Who is this olive tree? We're told in Jeremiah 11:17 that this olive tree is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How do these broken branches get restored and repaired? That is what Paul explains in Romans chapter 11. And that is how and why he explains that the natural branches, when they get restored, are grafted in, and that the wild branches also get grafted in. So in Jeremiah 11, verses 16 and 17, we're told that the literal house of Jacob, it's likened to an olive tree, they consist of a literal house of Israel and the literal house of Judah. And it was at Mount Sinai that the name of the group who entered into covenant relationship with Yeshua and who Yeshua gave the Torah to and he entered into a marriage relationship with in Exodus chapter 19 verse 3 is the house of Jacob. But we also need to realize that when the God of Israel redeemed his people from Egypt, he made redemption available to all the whosoevers that would put the blood of the lamb upon their doorposts because this was just not something that the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were to do, but this was a decree in all the land of Egypt. And so every household in Egypt was required to put the blood of the lamb upon the doorhouse if they didn't want death to come upon their household. Those who did that, who lived in the land of Egypt, who were not physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Bible calls them the mixed multitude. They're spoken of in Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 and 38, when it says the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, and then it says, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. At Mount Sinai, The physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, along with this mixed multitude, together they're called the house of Jacob. So how does this mixed multitude, who are not physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how are they called the house of Jacob at Mount Sinai? That's because the Torah describes them as being strangers or sojourners. They would be adopted or grafted in. So we have this principle. The Torah teaches the principle that when the God of Israel redeems his people, he makes redemption available to all the whosoevers who want to be a part of that redemption, and he grafts them into the covenant that he made with the forefathers. We need to understand that in Messiah, the name of his redeemed family, which is also likened unto an olive tree, they are also called the house of Jacob. In Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, it says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he, the Messiah, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Who does he rule and reign over? A redeemed family. So he's ruling and reigning over a redeemed house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There is a literal house of Jacob, there's a redeemed house of Jacob. This redeemed house of Jacob is likened unto an olive tree in Romans 11, and we're told there that this olive tree consists of wild branches and natural branches. This is Paul's explanation how the broken branches... In the natural olive tree of Jeremiah 11, verses 16 and 17, gets restored or redeemed in Messiah. When they do, they get restored by being grafted in. The grafting process, the term for it in English, it's spelled S-C-I-O-N, Sion. You can also render that Sion, Zion. 
so the, the people who he's redeeming is Zion, and this is a term that describes the grafting process, which is actually spelled in English S-C-I-O-N. We need to realize that Romans 11 tells us that both the wild branches and the natural branches are grafted in. In Romans 11, verse 17, we're told how the wild branches are grafted in. If some of the branches be broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them, you partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Then in Romans 11:24 it says, For if you were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? I want you to notice that in Messiah both the natural branches and the wild branches are grafted in. All the members of the body of Messiah are members because they have been grafted in. It's just not non-Jews that get grafted in. All believers in Messiah get grafted in, Jews and non-Jews. We need to realize that in the redeemed family of the Messiah, it is through the renewed covenant. And the renewed covenant was made only with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is repeated in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So if you are in the new covenant, you have to be in in the covenant that was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How do you become a part of the new covenant? You get grafted in. So you get grafted into that covenant. You're grafted into that olive tree. That covenant was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So you become a part of the commonwealth of Israel and you are a part of this family of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If you are not native born, you are then a stranger and a whosoever that is a partaker of this covenant and we know that this covenant is offered to every person on the earth. All the whosoever's have this covenant available to them if they will accept Yeshua as the Messiah for the forgiveness of their sins. Therefore, the redeemed olive tree of Romans 11 consists of the redeemed house of Israel and the redeemed house of Judah. We have in the earth today a literal house of Jacob and a redeemed house of Jacob. Messiah entered into marriage with the literal house of Jacob at Mount Sinai. They were unfaithful, became an adulterous wife, and according to the letter of the Torah, by breaking the covenant, by being adulterous, they deserved death. But Messiah is going to show his love for his adulterous wife that rather than sentencing her to death, which he has a legal right to do, he's going to extend mercy to her and he's going to die to forgive her of her sins and to offer her redemption and to be his bride once again. Messiah then is married to the nation of Israel. In the book In the Garden of Torah by Rebbe Schneerson, on page 163 and 164, he explains that at Mount Sinai that there's a relationship of marriage between the God of Israel and his people. Rather than using the term the house of Jacob, Rabbi Schneerson uses the term Jewish people, but we need to really understand it as the house of Jacob. He writes, one of the analogies used to describe the relationship between God and he says the Jewish people, but we need to understand the house of Jacob, is the love between a man and a woman. The love between, we understand, the house of Jacob and the God of Israel it is a complex dynamic union. The Holy One, blessed be he, and Israel are one. How are they one? Because they are married unto each other. Indeed, the prophet and this is from Isaiah, uses the simile, your maker is your mate. We need to understand that it was at Mount Sinai that a wedding took place and Messiah entered into betrothal with the 
house of Jacob. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2, it is written, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousal. The word espousal is the Strong's number 3623, and it's the Hebrew word kalula. It means betrothal or espousal. There are two main stages to the biblical marriage. The first is betrothal. Betrothal is when you are legally married. Biblically, you're married. In the eyes of the God of Israel, you're married. But you do not physically dwell with your mate. And this is what happened at Mount Sinai. There was a betrothal made between the Messiah and the house of Jacob, but he wasn't physically dwelling with his people. When has he got to physically dwell with the house of Jacob? It's got to be during the Messianic era when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. That's when he's got to physically dwell with his bride. In order for there to be a marriage, there has to be a marriage proposal. This is the proposal that the Messiah made with the house of Jacob. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, he says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus ye shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now therefore, here's the proposal. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, that is to follow Torah, if you will follow Torah, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's the proposal. Was the proposal accepted? It was in Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. When she said, I do, that means that a marriage had taken place. When you have a biblical marriage, you are going to have terms and conditions of that marriage, which is called a ketubah. The outline of the terms and the conditions of the marriage is specified, among other places, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which says, if you will be faithful to the marriage, all these blessings will come upon you, but if you're unfaithful, all these curses will come upon you. In this marriage, Moses is seen as being one of the witnesses of the marriage, and he's the one that escorts the bride the house of Jacob, the nation of Israel, to Mount Sinai, which is seen as being a hoopah, which is the wedding canopy where a biblical wedding will take place. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 17, it says, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. The word nether is the Strong's number 8482. It's the Hebrew word takti. This word means the lower part. The imagery is that the people were standing at the lower part of the mountain, and Mount Sinai is seen as being a hoopah, so they were standing underneath the hoopah, and they then from there took their wedding vows. If you're going to have a biblical marriage, the God of Israel requires that his bride be sanctified. He's only got to marry a sanctified, holy bride. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, the God of Israel says unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. They were to be sanctified. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Messiah prays this prayer. Sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Why is Messiah praying that his people be sanctified? Because the one that gets sanctified is his bride, and he's praying for his bride to be sanctified, because when she's sanctified, then he will be able to live and dwell with her. But she's sanctified through the truth. What is the truth? In Psalm 119, verse 142, it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. So Messiah was praying in John 17, 17, that his people be sanctified through the truth, which is the Torah. We can also see this in Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 6, which says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. The Torah of truth was in his mouth. In Exodus 19, verse 10, It says, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. 
what is the washing of their clothes a reference to? Well, we can see this explained for us in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arraigned in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 14 and 15, in explaining the sanctification process, it says in Exodus 19, verse 15, And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, and come not at your wives. The word come here is the Strong's number 5066. It's the Hebrew word nagash. And the Hebrew word nagash means to draw near or to approach. And the imagery here and the connotation here is in a sexual manner. Why was this commanded? The message that the God of Israel was trying to convey is that he did not want his bride coming to him in an unclean state. Therefore, how do we understand this? Because in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 5 and 6, it says, But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and has not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither has defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has come near to a menstruous woman. So this is what the God of Israel was trying to prevent when he made the specification in Exodus chapter 19 unto the people as a condition of coming to the mountain to be betrothed. The Torah then gets received by the nation of Israel as a marriage covenant from the Messiah. And now we're seeing the fulfillment at Mount Sinai of the purpose of creation. Then, ultimately, once this is done, in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, it says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He's in covenant relationship with his people, and the glory of the Lord is filling the tabernacle. His presence is with his people. That's what is the purpose of creation, is that the Messiah would be dwelling and abiding with his people. We can see this ultimately in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, which says about the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So the Messiah, the glory of God that is lightened up, he is dwelling with his bride in the new Jerusalem. In order to understand a spiritual picture of the relationship between the Messiah and the nation of Israel, the house of Jacob, his betrothed wife, we have a foreshadowing of what this relationship is would entail and what would happen when they entered into marriage, going back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, where it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. This deep sleep is a spiritual representation and communication that the nation of Israel would go into exile because in Ezekiel in chapter 34, verses 30 and 31, the nation of Israel is called Adam. So they would go into a deep sleep, which is spiritual slumber, which is breaking the covenant, not obeying the Torah. The consequences of that is exile in the nation. And as a result of the nation of Israel being exiled into the nations, he took one of the ribs, this is going to be a reference to the death of Messiah on the tree, and he closed up the flesh, which is the wound of the exile, and the rib, that is the death of Messiah on the tree, which the Lord God had taken from man, that's the sins of the world, from that he made a woman who is the bride of Messiah, and she was brought to him. How was she brought unto him? By the Ruach HaKodesh, or by the Holy Spirit, who draws us unto the Messiah. 
In Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24, it then says, And Adam said, and we're told in the New Testament that Messiah is called the last Adam. So we can interpret this, that Messiah said as a result, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, which is the bride or the body of Messiah, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, this man here is a reference to the Messiah, leave his father, that's his heavenly father, and his mother, that is the divine presence, and shall cleave unto his wife, that is his bride, and they shall be one flesh. So Genesis 2.24 is explaining that Messiah has got to come to the earth to die for his bride. What we just read in Genesis chapter 2 is what Paul explains and understood from Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 23 and then verses 31 and 32, it is written, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is the head of the congregation, and he's the Savior of the body. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh, quoting from Genesis chapter 2. And then he says, this is a great mystery. Now, if I'm reading this Hebraically, what he's saying is this is a deeper level understanding of the Torah that's not readily seen and understood with the literal reading of the text. It's only understood in the deeper meaning, and I put in parentheses for you the deeper meaning. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Messiah and his congregation. Continuing on, the foreshadowing here of what happened in the garden, which is a prophecy of what is to come. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, which personified obeying the God of Israel, which is obeying Torah, following the Messiah. Also in the midst of the garden, he also placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which represents disobeying Torah. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. In Genesis 2.17 it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that is, disobeying Torah, you shall not eat, or you shall not disobey Torah, because if you disobey Torah, for the day that you eat, you will surely die. What is the death? Going into exile. Exile in the nations is described as being spiritual slumber. It's described as being a death. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This word presence is the Strong's number 6440. It's the Hebrew word panim, and it actually means they hid themselves from the face of God or the presence of God. And you can see from this there's a separation because of sin that Adam and Eve were separated from the presence of God. That separation can be likened unto exile. When they were separated from the presence of God, that's when they became or noticed that they were naked. And so nakedness there is a description of being without the presence of the covering of the God of Israel. We can see this in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 37 and 39. Behold, therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you have taken pleasure and all them that you have loved with all them that you have hated. I will even gather them round about against you and will discover your nakedness unto them that they may see your nakedness. So when they go into exile, they're referred to as being naked because they lost their covering because they disobeyed Torah. And I will also give you into their hand, and they shall throw down your eminent place and shall break down your high places. They will strip you of your clothes and shall take your fair jewels and leave you naked and bare. As a result of Adam and Eve's sin, they are exiled or divorced from the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, it says, So he drove out the man. This word, drove out, is the Strong's number 1644. It's the Hebrew word garash. And one of the meanings of garash, it means to drive out or expel. It means divorce or put away. Adam and Eve were divorced or exiled from the Garden of Eden. 
What are some of the consequences of sin? It results in nakedness. It results in the hiding of the face of the God of Israel. And sin results in exile, separation, or divorce. We see prophetically then how restoration has got to come. It's got to come by a circumcised heart through the Messiah. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 says, So he drove out, that is exile or divorce, the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The word flaming sword is the Strong's number 2719. It's the Hebrew word cherub. And we're going to see where this word cherub is used and what it's used for in Joshua chapter 5 verse 2 as it is written. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, make you sharp knives. It's the same Hebrew word that's translated as a flaming sword in Genesis 3.24. And here, what's being done with this carob or this sharp knife, is it's being used to circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. The way to the tree of life is through this cutting instrument, which can or was used for circumcision. What we're being shown here is that the way back to the tree of life, which is restoration, is repenting and returning to Torah. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, that is the understanding and the context of the renewed covenant. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and what happens when he puts his spirit within us? His spirit within us has got to cause us to walk in my statutes, you shall keep my judgments and do them. Looking at Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 in Hebrew, where it says a flaming sword turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In Hebrew, it says, Aleph Tav Derek Eitz Ha Hayim. Aleph Tav, the way to the tree of life. The way to the tree of life is through Aleph Tav, who's the Messiah. He's the one that would bring restoration. Following the marriage that was made with the Messiah in the house of Jacob at Mount Sinai, the covenant got broken, and it got broken through the worship of the golden calf. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 19, it says, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and he brake them beneath the mount. So the house of Jacob committed adultery against the Messiah by worshiping other gods. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 14, it says, And you shall not go aside from any of the words which I command you this day. You shall not go aside from following Torah, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods and to serve them. Judges chapter 2, verse 13. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. In Judges chapter 2, verse 13, it says, They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth is the goddess of sex and fertility. We render Ashtoreth as Ishtar, which it's anglicized into English as Easter. In the fertility customs that's associated with Easter, the, the Easter egg, and that type of thing, the connotation is back to Ishtar in the fertility of the land in the spring. We're told that the God of Israel is a jealous God. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 12, and verse 14, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. So did the Messiah get jealous because his people went and served other gods? Yes, he did. Therefore, according to Torah, she is to take this test to see 
whether she is innocent or guilty of going after other gods. This is going to begin to show for us the curses that's going to come upon an adulterous woman. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 24, it says, And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse. And the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. If she's guilty, she's going to drink bitter water. This is a curse of an adulterous woman. And looking at the sin of the golden calf, we're told in Exodus chapter 32, verses 19 and 20, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, and saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and brake them beneath the mount. He took the calf which they had made, and burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and he made the children of Israel to drink of it. She's drinking of the bitter water, which is a penalty for being adulterous. Looking at other elements and aspects of what we come upon an adulterous woman, we look at Exodus 32, verses 26 and 27. Then Moses stood in the gates of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. This is a result of the golden calf incident so one of the punishments of an adulterous woman is she would be slain with the sword now in ezekiel chapter 16 verse 38 and verse 40 we have another characteristic which says and i will judge you as a woman that breaks wedlock and shed blood or judge and i will give you blood and fury and jealousy they also shall bring up a company against you, and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. Once again, we're told here that she would be slain with the sword. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 23, we are told, And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. So her curses are written in a book. We have another characteristic in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. That is, she would be forsaken by her husband. There it is written, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, you shall sleep with your fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then... My anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. So in other words, by being adulterous, she would be forsaken by her husband. It goes on to say, not only will I forsake them, but I will hide my face from them. Another curse is that the face of her husband would be hidden from her. It goes on to say in Deuteronomy 31 verse 18, and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought and that they are turned unto other gods. Where the King James says, surely hide, the word surely is the Strong's number 5641. The word hide is the Strong's number 5641, which is the Hebrew word katar, which means to hide or conceal. So what this really says in Hebrew, it says, I will hide, hide my face. The word hide is repeated. So there's an amplification of the God of Israel saying, I'm going to hide my face and I'm going to be doing it in such a way that you won't recognize me. Who is the one that's speaking that's saying he's going to hide his face? In Isaiah chapter 54 verse 8 it says, In a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you says the Lord your Redeemer. So the one that hid his face is the Lord your Redeemer. Who's the Lord your Redeemer? It's the Messiah. So the Messiah says that if you break my covenant that I'm making with you at Mount Sinai, as a consequence, I'm going to hide my face in such a way that you're not going to recognize me. Do you know how well he hid his face 
neither traditional Judaism nor traditional Christianity recognizes that it was Yeshua that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, neither recognizes that he's the one that entered into marriage with the house of Jacob there. That is how well he hid his face. And how well has he hid his redemption from the literal house of Jacob that in the earth today is recognized by the world, personified by the Jewish people? Well, he's done it in such a way that the Messiah of the nation of Israel is not viewed in the eyes of the traditional Jewish people as being one who fulfills the prophecies that is specified in the Torah and the Prophets. How is the truth of the reality of who Messiah is he being hidden today in fulfillment of the prophecy that I'll surely hide my face? He's seen in his mask as being a Gentile Messiah, a Greek Messiah who doesn't advocate that his people follow Torah. Those who claim he's the Messiah say that they've disconnected themselves from the events at Mount Sinai and they've disconnected themselves from following Torah. This is how he fulfilled the prophecy that he would hide his face. And continuing on at the curses that would come upon an adulterous woman, it says in Hosea in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her as a dry land and slay her with thirst. One of her consequences is that she would be slain with thirst. It goes on to say in Hosea chapter 2 verse 3, I will strip her naked and set her as the day that she was born. So an adulterous woman would be stripped naked. We can also see this description of what the enemies of the nation of Israel would do when they got exiled in the nations. In Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 22 and 23, and verse 26, it is written, Therefore, O Haliba, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up your lovers against you, from whom your mind is alienated, and I will bring them against you on every side, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, Pekod, Shoah, Koah, and all the Assyrians with them. And it goes on to say, they will strip you of your clothes and take away your fair jewels. In Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 30, and then in verse 32 and continuing, we're going to see that one of the curses of an adulterous woman is she's going to be last to scorn. Let's see how and why she's laughed to scorn. In Ezekiel 23.30 it is written, I will do these things unto you because you've gone a whoring after the heathen because you were polluted with their idols. Thus says the Lord God, you shall drink of your sister's cup deep and large and you shall be laughed to scorn and be in derision because it contains much. So you're going to be laughed at and ridiculed because you're going after other gods and you're not obeying my Torah and my commandments. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 28 through 30, it says, You have played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. You couldn't get enough. Yea, you've played the harlot with them, and yet you could not be satisfied. You have moreover multiplied your fornication in the land of Canaan and Chaldea, and yet you were not satisfied. How weak is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do these things, the work of an imperish, whorish woman. Ezekiel 16, verses 31 and 32, here is where the God of Israel mocks his adulterous wife with these words. In that you build your eminent place in the head of every way, and you make your high place, a high place is a term for committing adultery or whoredom or fornication, and you have not been as a harlot because you scorn or you despise higher, but as a wife that commits adultery which takes strangers instead of her husband, 
they give gifts to all whores, but you give gifts to all your lovers, and you hire them that they may come unto you on every side for your whoredom. So therefore, Ezekiel 16, verse 32, you are contrary or you commit whoredom from other people or other women that commit whoredom because none follow you in the way that you commit whoredom and that you give a reward, but no reward is given unto you. Here's how he's mocking her. He says, normally, when you commit whoredom, you at least receive a gift for your services. But rather than receiving a gift for your services and at least getting something out of your whoredom, you are actually paying to commit your whoredom, and you're not receiving anything for committing your whoredom. And so you don't even know how to commit whoredom. So she's mocked for her whoredom. Next, it says in Joel chapter 3, verse 3, and Obadiah chapter 1, verse 11, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they might drink. And the day that you stood on the other side, the other side is a reference to not following Torah, disobeying Torah, and the day that you disobeyed Torah, and the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem. So one of the curses of an adulterous woman is her enemies would cast lots for her. Let's summarize the curses of an adulterous woman which we have covered. Number one, she would drink bitter water or be given a bitter cup. Number two, she would be slain with the sword. Number three, her curses are written in a book and blotted out. Number four, she is forsaken by her husband. Number five, her husband hides his face from her. Number six, she is slain with thirst. Number seven, she is stripped naked. Number eight, she is laughed to scorn. Number nine, she is mocked for her whoredom. Number ten, her enemies cast lots for her. With this understanding, now let's look at the way the death of the Messiah is being described. First, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 42, it says, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. So what is he saying? You're giving me a bitter cup to drink. Next, in John chapter 19, verse 34, it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. He's slain with a sword. He's slain with a spear. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the tree. The curses that were written in a book are blotted out. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, it says, In about the ninth hour, Yeshua cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he is dying the death of his adulterous woman who was forsaken, and so he's forsaken by his father. Matthew 27:45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land under the ninth hour. The father hid his face from Yeshua because there was darkness over the land. John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, After this, Yeshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Messiah is taken upon himself a curse of an adulterous woman who would be thirsty. Matthew chapter 27, verse 28 and verse 31, we see where he's got to be stripped of his clothes or stripped naked. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, and after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Next, Messiah is last in mocked, which is a curse upon an adulterous woman. Luke 23, 35, and 36. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Messiah, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. In Luke 23:34, we see that they cast lots for his garments. 
Then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. How is it that Messiah is dying on the tree, the penalty of an adulterous woman, which is specified in the Torah and the prophets? How is he able to do this? Because Messiah is married to the house of Jacob. They are, in being married to each other, they are one. And when you are married, your life is intertwined with the life of the one that you're married to. When they hurt, you hurt. When they rejoice, you rejoice. That is how, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 19, it says, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. Messiah hurts because he feels the pain that is being suffered because his wife is committing harlotry and adultery. It is paining him. In Isaiah chapter 63, verses 8 and 9, it says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. We're talking about the Savior, the Messiah. And then it says in Isaiah 63, 9, In all their affliction, he was afflicted. He's afflicted the same way that they are because... Israel and the Messiah are one. You cannot separate them. He identifies with his people. That is why it can be said in Psalm 44, verse 22, about his people, Yea, for your sake we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So his people are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But now, let's look what it says in Acts chapter 8, verses 32 and verse 35. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached Messiah. So Messiah is the sheep that was led to the slaughter. Well, here his people are like sheep, but here Messiah is led as a sheep. How is this so? Because, once again, Messiah and his wife are one. They're ahad. What happens to the Messiah happens to Israel. What happens to the Israel happens to the Messiah. Messiah was resurrected after three days. His people are going to be resurrected after three days. That is the duration of the exile into all the nations of the world. Why did Messiah need to die on the tree to redeem his adulterous wife? Why was there no other way to redeem her besides this way? Well, we need to understand biblical marriage laws. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, it is written, When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give her into her hand and send her out of the house. What's the house? The land of Israel. Send her out of the house, exile her from the land of Israel. And when she is departed out of the house, exiled from the land of Israel, she may go and be another man's wife. However, in Deuteronomy 24, verses 3 and 4, it says, If her latter husband, if her second husband hates her, and he then writes her a bill of divorce and gives it into her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the second husband dies, which took her to be a wife, her former husband or her, her original husband or her first husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, because she's been defiled. And that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not cause the land to sin, which the Lord God gives you for an inheritance. Based upon what the Torah says about these marriage laws, we understand then that if the first husband gives a divorce, and then the second husband also gives a divorce, then, according to Torah, you are not permitted to remarry the first husband from the divorce of the second husband. So who's the first husband that the nation of Israel, the house of Jacob, had at Mount Sinai? Her husband is Yeshua the Messiah, but they went after other gods. And so according to Deuteronomy 24, 1 and 2, once Messiah gave a bill of divorcement, which he did to the northern kingdom in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, he gave the northern kingdom a bill of divorce. You cannot remarry the original husband. So how's Messiah going to redeem his adulterous wife. We need to understand before we look at that, that in the Bible, exile is associated and linked with divorce. 
Leviticus chapter 26 verse 14 and verse 33. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, I will scatter you among the heathen. The scattering is being exiled from the house or it is likened unto a divorce. Here in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, we see where a divorce certificate was given to the northern kingdom. We're told that both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are harlots. Specifically, a bill of divorce was given to the northern kingdom. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now, based upon these Torah marriage laws, the nation of Israel has asked the question in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. Here's the question that the God of Israel poses to his people. They say, meaning the Torah says, If a man puts away his wife, and she goes from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? What does it say in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4? No. Shall not the land be greatly polluted? What does Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 says? Yes, but here's what the God of Israel says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. You have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, says the Lord. He makes them understand that according to the Torah, if they come after you've played the harlot, the land is greatly polluted. And after he makes them recognize that, you know, the land is greatly polluted and it's an abomination to me, he then says, return unto me, posing the question. Figure this one out. Figure how this can be so and me not violate Torah. The answer to it is this, that there is no way for the Messiah to redeem his people unless and until he dies on the tree. That's the only way the return can come. Why? It is because the only way that Yeshua can redeem his adulterous wife who married other gods and was thus exiled and divorced and not violate Torah, the only way he can do it and not violate Torah is to die on the tree. And this is really what Paul was explaining in Romans chapter 7, because the death separates the vow. And when he died, there's no longer the original vow, he resurrects as a new man. And that new man has never been married before. And the condition that he offers to marry that new man is, it is done by receiving the blood that I shed. And that blood covers up the sin. So... His former adulterous wife, though your sins be a scarlet, whoredom, they shall be as white as snow because his blood covers it up. And now he ends up taking a repentant, whoredish, adulterous wife and she has the status through the blood uh, of Messiah as being a virgin. Romans chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. And actually, the context, he's speaking about those that know Torah marriage law. How that the law, or Torah marriage law, or a marriage between a husband and a wife, there is a contractual commitment, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For a woman which has a husband is bound by the law, or bound by marriage law, to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is loosed from the law of her husband. In other words, if the husband dies, she's permitted to remarry again because death severs those original vows. Romans chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. So then if, while her husband lives, this is referring to Messiah who had not yet died on the tree, if she's married to another man following other gods, not believing in Yeshua as the Messiah, she's an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, once Messiah dies on the tree, she is free from that law, which was the original vows that was made at Mount Sinai, which condemned her to death because she broke the terms of it. She's free from that law, and thus, being freed from it, she's not an adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. Dead to what law? Dead to that original marriage vow that was made at Mount Sinai because Messiah died. You are dead to the law by the body of Messiah that you should be married to another, 
Who are you married to? The one that is raised from the dead, that is the new man. And by doing so, we should bring forth fruit unto God. The death of Messiah allows for the redemption of his bride and not breaking Torah. This is the only way that he can redeem her. This is what Paul was explaining here in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. But because we do not know Torah and we do not know the events that happen here, traditional Christianity has taken Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, and they've said that Paul was explaining that we don't follow the law anymore. We're dead to the law. And that is not what he is explaining. So in summarizing this message we understand that Yeshua laid down his life to redeem an adulterous wife whom he married at Mount Sinai and who pledged there at Mount Sinai to keep his commandments. Instead of being a faithful wife and keeping his commandments, she worshipped other gods. Rather than seeing her die according to the letter of the law, which was permissible according to the Torah, Messiah chose to show abundant mercy toward her by shedding his blood on the tree to forgive her of her sins. In doing so, Messiah demonstrated to his adulterous wife his incomprehensible love for her as well as his love for the entire world. Ultimately then, as a result of this love that Messiah showed by laying down his life, for her, which is a requirement to be a redeemer, according to Torah, Yeshua will dwell with his redeemed bride during the Messianic era and ultimately will spend eternity with her in the heavenly Jerusalem. This is our understanding and connection and seeing how the events at Mount Sinai are related and connected to the death of the Messiah on the tree, and by understanding these things, you biblically understand how the Bible really is one book, it's consistent with one another, it's linked with one another, and you need what was originally given, which is commonly called the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures is known as the Tanakh, you need that to be linked with and matched with the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, to see the totality of the picture of the plan of the God of Israel that he originally had in his heart in creation, but gets fulfilled through Yeshua the Messiah. Traditional Christianity, they have disconnected themselves from the events at Mount Sinai, so therefore they view that the writings of the New Testament are a contradiction to the Old Testament, and so they see a contradiction, so they say, well, which one do I believe? Well, we'll, we'll believe the, the New Covenant. And in truth, they need to realize, and if they would realize, that in the volume of the book it is spoken of the Messiah, in Psalm 40, verse 7, that he is the one who created the heavens and the earth, he's the one that redeemed his people from Egypt, he's the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, he's the one that ended into marriage with his people, and as a result of his people being unfaithful to the marriage oath, which they had made at Mount Sinai, Messiah shows his love for his bride by dying on the tree to redeem her and ultimately ask her to change her heart and her changing her heart in the renewed covenant not only forgives her sins but gives her the indwelling Holy Spirit to give her the power to overcome her carnal or her sin nature so that she could love the Messiah with all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength. So I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. And in concluding the message, hopefully the revelation of this message will help us even more to understand and realize the truth of 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. that says, He who says he abides in Messiah ought himself to walk even as he walked. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.